In the future, you can implant fake memories in your head to live out your fantasies. Well, until the FBI comes cracking down on you. At the end of the 21st century, global chemical warfare has left the planet nearly uninhabitable. Now, living space is Earth's most valuable resource. Only two territories remain, the United Federation of Britain and the Colony. Workers from the Colony travel through the planet each day on the only transport possible, the fall. So what I just read to you is the prologue of this movie. And as you can probably tell, this movie is going to be real intense. In fact, in the first scene, we see this man and his partner, a woman, Gotta specify that these days? Trying to run away from some robot assassinators. The flickering lights in the scene are enough to give me a seizure though. And I can't believe these guys actually decide this is the best time to hug and tell each other I love you for the first time. You guys ever heard of priorities? Well, I guess it turned out to be the smart choice because the guy gets captured just a few moments after. But then he wakes up because it was all a dream. I am definitely not pleased. When he wakes up to tell his wife about his dream, he admits the part about seeing another woman in the dream. And that's understandable. Wouldn't want to upset the wife now, would you? Anyway, the couple's cuddle time is cut short as news breaks about a bombing in the United Federation of Britain, called the UFB, and the wife has to leave to do her job. Now, in many people's opinion, the guy behind this bombing is one Matthias, the leader of a resistance movement, and his right-hand man, Carl Hauser. By the way, to clarify, the UFB, a subtle way of referring to our very own Britain or the United Kingdom, is a slaving monster of a nation, and the colony, a subtle way of referring to many of the British colonies Britain barged into and enslaved, is, well, a UFB colony. Matthias and his resistance movement want to get independence, but of course, UFB doesn't think that's a good idea. So therein lies the conflict of the story. That said, on his way to work, we now see our main character take the so-called fall with his friend. It doesn't seem as barbaric as I thought it would be, to be honest. It kind of seems very high-tech and stuff. It's like this gigantic, highly complex elevator that I'm very sure will make me throw up if I were in it. It even has this space reverse gravity stuff going on with it. Anyway, we finally find out that our main character's name is Doug, and he's a factory worker at a plant where they make synthetic police. But Doug is bored out of his mind with his job. To be fair, it is a pretty crappy one. So he decides to go to this place where they design and implant artificial memories. Recall. You know, just to live a fantasy for once. Recall looks a little shifty to me, not gonna lie. And these statues of Buddha don't exactly put my mind at ease. Anyway, when Doug gets there, he chooses the fantasy of a secret agent. The guy who's implanting the memories, Mac, warns him that fantasies cannot be based on real life, or else a person's brain could literally blow up. Mac runs the psychopolygraphic panel on Doug to be sure that everything is good to go. At first, Doug is cleared for takeoff into the world of fantasies. But before he can begin his fantasy, the psychopolygraph panel, and frankly Doug himself, finds out that Doug is actually a secret agent. Panicked, Mac makes to shoot Doug, but at that moment, police burst into the room and it's like Doug transforms into another human being. He just starts fending them off left and right, shooting the officers with way more skills than a common factory man should have. They all die, but there are more coming for him outside. With unbelievable skills, he escapes from them and consequently makes the news. When he gets home, Doug tries to relay his ordeal to Lori, his wife. She dismisses his revelations and then proceeds to try and kill Doug, but Doug's superhuman strength comes on again, and he claps the living crap out of Lori. Well, you've got to give Lori her flowers too because she's also kicking butt. Now to the big question. Why is Lori trying to clap her husband? Turns out she's a UFB spy and what they have is a fake marriage that has only existed for six weeks, not seven years as Doug believed. Dun dun dun. <laughs> as it turns out, Doug's mind was actually erased and then his mind was implanted with a life he thought he'd lived. So in other words, Douglas Quaid doesn't exist. So who is not Douglas Quaid? A highly trained guy, a certain guy named Kuhagin, is trying to hide from the resistance. I guess we'll find out what that means later. For now though, Lori and Doug are jumping from roof to roof like the amazing Spider-Man, with Doug trying to escape and Lori giving a hot pursuit. The way they're jumping, it's like there's a special class for jumping roofs in secret agent school. Doug finally loses Lori and her team of synth police and gets a call. Fun fact, the phone is in his palm. Anyway, the call he gets is from a certain Hammond. Hammond reveals to him that they worked at Federal Intel together, and that Doug had asked Hammond to deliver a certain message to him should his phone ever get back on the grid. Hammond also tells Doug that his real name is Henry and warns him to dispose of the phone. So Doug finds a piece of broken glass and guess what? He does a little impromptu operation and digs out the phone. Who cares about infections, I guess? Meanwhile, Lori and her team are still trying to find Doug, but with his phone deactivated, they seem to have lost him. Lori's boss, the Chancellor, meanwhile, is furious, but not furious enough to want Doug killed on sight. He still wants Doug brought in alive so he can implant another memory into him. When he reveals his identity to Lori though, she's instantly enraged, so she gives her men the order to shoot on sight. Talk about tough love. From Hammond's call, Doug deduces that he has a safety deposit box at a bank called First Bank. So he goes there and finds his briefcase filled with passports, including his as Henry Reed. He also finds a collar, which apparently helps him to holographically disguise into any one of the identities on the other two passports. Then there's some cash as well, and one of them has Obama's face on it. That's crazy! He grabs a couple bunches of cash to stash in his pocket, and then he finds this recording that turns out to be a message from himself. In the message, Doug learns from himself that even his face
face is not his. The real him was captured and his face re-sculpted, after which they planted the fake memories. The real him now tells him to get to his house and find the key, but Doug doesn't know what the heck that is, or what it is for. He makes his way to the station to get into the UFB, but when he gets to security, his collar malfunctions and his real identity is revealed. Lori and her team waste no time to begin going after him again, but before they can get him, he jumps onto a flying car and is temporarily out of their reach. The woman from his dreams then comes to save him with her flying car, but Lori and her team are still in hot pursuit. You can tell Doug and this woman from his dreams maybe had a thing in his past life. You know, she's a little hurt, but he doesn't remember her, but she also understands. Also, when Doug refers to Lori as his wife, she's kind of thrown off. Anyway, Mystery Girl has blasted a few of the cop cars out of existence, but Lori is so far from done. I mean, this woman doesn't give up. What? Doug has got a plan though. He engages mag suspension, which apparently makes the car drop to the ground and destroy all the other cars on the ground by sheer force of gravity. But the effect of this move is costly as it causes his mystery girl to black out. He picks up his girl and goes to his former home, where he finds that there's a seal on almost everything. He tries unsuccessfully to search for the key like the video message from himself told him to, but he doesn't find any key. He does find though that he can play the piano, so good for him I guess. He starts to play, but then suddenly the piano stops playing even though he's striking a key, and that's when he finds out that the key in question is a dud. So he picks up the dud key, opens it, and reinserts it into the piano. Then he starts playing the piano all over again, and at the end of the tune, another video message comes up, revealing everything he needs to know about about himself. Guess what? He's not Douglas Quaid. He's not even Henry Reed. He is Carl Hauser, whom we knew at the beginning as the right-hand man to Matthias, leader of the resistance. But Hauser reveals to him that he's actually a federal intelligence operative who used to work for Cohagen. Cohagen had assigned him to infiltrate the resistance and assassinate Matthias, which was how he got in touch with Matthias. However, after working with the resistance and meeting a woman, of course, he discovered he was fighting for the wrong side, so he switched. Hauser further reveals that Cohagen is building a private army that would infiltrate the colony and dispossess the people there of their valuable living space. But Hauser has found out that Cohagen's private synthetic army has a kill code, and he informs Doug that it is now up to him to shut Cohagen down. According to Hauser's explanation, the kill code is in a box that's in Doug's head. All Doug has to do is reconnect with the resistance and deliver the code to Matthias. After watching the message, Doug finds it hard to accept what he has just heard. Melina, the girl from his dreams, tries to help him accept the truth, telling him that the dream he's been having was actually a memory. Anyway, there's no more time now. Lori and her people are here, so whatever Doug thinks, he's in this now and he's in it fully. At the ground floor of Doug's building, Doug meets Harry who tries to convince Doug that he's still back at recall and that he, Doug, was currently unresponsive. Harry explains that he was chemically transfused into Doug's mind to get him to come back. He also tries to manipulate Doug into thinking that Lori was distraught about the whole situation and that Melina wasn't real. They even have Lori crying outside like a widowed woman to make the setup ultra real. Doug is almost buying it. Melina calls Bull and reveals to Doug that she is real, as is Harry. She also tries to show Doug that Harry actually works for Cohagen. Harry then tries to get Doug to shoot Melina and come with him, but Doug sees a tear roll down Melina's eye and she shoots Harry instead. The shot is beautiful, kind of like David knocking down Goliath with the bullet landing dead center on Harry's forehead. Melina and Doug then make their breakaway as Lori and her team go after them again. They hop on onto an elevator, but before they can make a clean breakaway, Lori makes her way in and a fierce fight ensues. Melina takes on Lori while Doug goes against one of the synth police. It's merciless combat with slaps, jabs, and kicks. After a while, Lori plants a bomb in the elevator and jumps out, leaving Doug and Melina to blow up with the unit. But Doug and Melina make it out just in time, and the unit goes to orange blazes without them in it. After having a literal blast. Melina takes Doug to see Matthias, the resistance leader. We learn there that Matthias is Melina's dad. The place where Matthias is hiding is very scary looking, giving very much Silent Hill vibes, if you've seen the movie, or at least my recap. Anyway, over at Matthias's place, the resistance tries to find the kill code in the black box Hauser talked about, but then another revelation is made. This was all a setup by Cohagen, but when they are about to retrieve the kill code, Cohagen's hologram shows up instead, and Lori and her strike team bust in. Following closely behind is none other than Cohagen himself. Cohagen reveals that there was no kill code. It was simply fabricated to get Hauser and Doug to lead Cohagen directly to Matthias. Shortly after his revelation, Cohagen shoots Matthias dead, captures Doug, and retrieves all of Matthias's plans to get back at Cohagen and his government. Cohagen further reveals that Doug was sent to seduce Matthias's daughter in order to get close to Matthias. He also lies that it was Doug who came up with the idea to fake his own capture so that his slate could be wiped clean with new memories implanted. This way, Hauser, that is Doug, could trick Matthias into thinking he was on his side. Melina is looking so hurt right now, it's heartbreaking. After his long monologue, Cohagen reveals that he's now going to restore Doug back to his former self, Hauser. But Doug no longer seems interested in being his old self. I mean, you can't blame him. Just as Cohagen's goons are about to inject Doug's old memories, it is revealed that Hammond is among the men assigned to Doug to his former self. Hammond frees his mind, but in the shootout that follows, he dies. Meanwhile, Cohagen is preparing for a military invasion into the colony. Cohagen's men find some place for Melina, dropping her off in the fall. Doug, on the other hand, is making his way to the fall as well, where Cohagen has also loaded his robot army, preparing to move them
them into the colony for invasion. As he sneaks around looking for Melina, Doug sets up explosives at strategic points in the travel unit. He finally finds Melina and frees her, but for someone who by himself set explosives everywhere, he seems to have an awful amount of free time on his hands because he still has all this time for hugging and stuff when he knows everywhere is about to explode. Again, impeccable sense of priority. You can explode in your pants later. Of course, before they can escape, the couple is stopped by Cohagen's men, and at just that precise moment, the gravity change occurs, but the shootout must happen regardless, and so both teams start to shoot at each other. Not quite sure that's how a shootout would work in an anti-gravity setting, but I've not been to space, so who am I to say? Anyway, when gravity is restored, Doug breaks open the emergency door and jumps out of the fall with Melina. Doug then has a go with Cohagen's synth army as Cohagen himself tries to kill him. By the way, I have to hand it to him. Cohagen is surprisingly strong. He holds Doug down with one hand, but then Doug reveals that the explosives he planted are about to blow in 10 seconds. As the explosives start to blow, killing Cohagen's army, Doug stamps Cohagen with his own knife. Shortly after, the fall crashes into smithereens, clapping Cohagen and his army, rip in peace. Meanwhile, Melina and Doug jump off the fall just in time into safety. Doug has suffered many injuries though, so after he jumps, he passes out. Naturally, Melina is distraught, but in the next scene, we see Doug in an ambulance recuperating and Melina is beside him. She looks like she's been up all night roaring for him, but then Doug realizes something. She has no scar in her hand. She's not the real Melina. Of course, need I tell you who it is? It's Lori. This girl is a persistent bleh. Once Doug finds out the truth, he flings her to the wall and the two enter into combat. Doug finally pushes her through the door of the ambulance and she falls to her death. When Doug exits the ambulance, he finds the real Melina walking towards him. They fall into an embrace as the news reports announce the colony's independence. Moral of the story? Just subscribe already.